Hi, everyone. March 23rd, 2023. What's happening in the Sydney area, New South Wales, Australia, uh, Southeast Queensland, the flooding continues. And they're saying it's going to go on for a couple of days. Thousands of homes are underwater. So much livestock drowned. It's so heartbreaking. The devastation in this area is really, oh, breathtaking, heartbreaking, and it's really, no matter how bad things get, you know, maybe a few begin to question what is going on, but we need many, many, many more. So in this video, I'm going to show you what's going on right now, and then I'll you know, just produce some documents that prove that, yes, man can make an awful, awful, awful lot of rain that can cause the destruction that you will see in this video. The grip of floodwaters around Richmond and Windsor on the Hawkesbury has tightened, causing misery for people on either side of the river. North Richmond is isolated and communities downstream are now returning to find the damage to their homes is worse than they could ever have imagined. The still waters around Pitt Town are running deep and wide, so deep they have swallowed home after home. We took to the water with local Dave Murphy we found what's left of his home. I'm absolutely gut-wrenched, like it's just, I can't believe it. I cannot believe that I'm looking at my house from sitting in a boat. I always expected sooner or later we'd probably get, you know, maybe a foot or a metre of water through the house. So when I'd done the renovations, I sort of always had that in mind, but never did I ever think this had happened. He moved in with his family six weeks ago, his $2 million forever home. This was it before the Hawkesbury claimed it, an immaculate homestead. Now it's drowning in four metres of brown soup. What's going to happen when the water goes down? What's going to be left? Oh, I'd expect a bare carcass and, um, you know, we start, start again, strip it out. He's lost farming equipment and even when he tried to find high ground for his motorbike, the river claimed that too. Dave, you put the motorcycle on the roof thinking nothing was going to touch it. Look at it. Yeah, I never ever thought that it would uh, get wet. Already people in this area are talking about what will happen when the waters recede. That could still take several days. But look at what's going to be left here. Containers, rubbish. We've even just spotted a caravan that's been washed aside. It's going to take a long, long time for all this debris to be cleaned up on both sides of the river. Around 30 kilometres downstream from Pitt Town is Wiseman's Ferry. A shipping container is adrift. It first targets a car ferry. Now watch as a boat heads straight towards the two-ton steel box, diverting it and averting a collision with more than a dozen houseboats. Simon McQuillan was the man behind the wheel. We just got out there as quickly as we could, get the, got the safety gear on, and uh, we're ready for this kind of eventuation. So there are Probably thousands of heroes around this community, you just don't see it. Many homes around Wiseman's Ferry are cut off. Tinnies, the only way to get supplies. Out of food, out of fuel. Generators, we've got no power, so we're running a generator and need fuel for the generator. Just doing an emergency run over. And here the SES rescued a team of Telstra workers trapped for four days. We had plenty of food, plenty of water. We're running out of beer and cigarettes, so we sort of better get out of here. With no clean running water, we actually collected water from buckets coming off the roof. On the west side of the Hawkesbury lies North Richmond. It's cut off by floodwaters on one side and on the other, a landslide on the Bell's line of road. <laughs> Choppers came to the rescue of two pregnant women in North Richmond, taking them for the short trip to the RAAF base. Just a little bit nerve-wracking knowing that it could happen any day now. Going back into North Richmond, the fire and rescue team relieving a crew that had been trapped. Yeah, it'd be good to get home and get out of the wet for a little while. The supermarkets in North Richmond are stripped bare. For most, the only way to get essentials is by boat. 
A hundred years ago, this is how locals moved their crops to market. Now, the Hawkesbury Highway is back, moving medical and pharmacy supplies. It's just like the ferries at Manly made. It's wet, uncomfortable and not without its dangers. But everywhere you look, Hawkesbury people are tackling the floods with a smile. They know the real work, cleaning up, lies ahead. Mark Burrows, Nine News. This is 18 minutes and 36 seconds, so there's quite a lot more. The devastation is beyond, well, the scale of it, the... The um, it's I mean listening to the people who've been rescued or lost their homes it is so devastating. This has been going on for days and it's going to continue to go on for days. Tens of thousands have been evacuated. As the river rose. We worked quite quickly to get those people out of the house and to safety. On this mission, walking Beryl Rand from her waterlogged home. It started last night, water rising. I was going to stay. Beryl is a relative newcomer to the riverfront. She's only lived here six or seven years. This is my first flood. There was nothing she could do about the house. Her animals more important. My horses are over the road here. They were safe, along with a litter of puppies. The chops are on their own. Beryl warned the hen house was off limits, told... You risk your life going in there. The chickens were left to perch up high. Neighbour Sharina Kalchi helped rescue Beryl's cat. She calls this one lilac. The work of this SES crew went till just before dawn, replaced by another crew, then, during the day, another. The dedication of volunteers who train and sacrifice their time to help others. When you see how much water is flowing through this suburb, it's hard to imagine that this is usually just a small creek. Today, it's more like a lake and residents are hopeful the water will recede as quickly as it came up. Back at McGrath's Hill, Jacob Horn's house is still half submerged. An overturned alley truck blocks the flooded road while a catamaran bobs around in the distance. If it keeps rising, now, I've got to access the boat to get into the house still to uh, start getting stuff out if I have to. Kate Creedon, Nine News. There are still entire communities on the state's mid-north coast without power or access to services. A... I have an awful lot more, but why don't we just listen to this excerpts of this video. Charlie Hatfield, the rainmaker, in the very, very, very early, early 1900s, flooded out San Diego, causing tremendous destruction. Like 19, uh, in between 1900 and 1905, I think they'll give the date in this video. Basic idea for rainmaking is you're not going to produce it out of a clear sky, but if you have a lot of clouds in the sky, then the idea is, well, what can we do to those clouds to make them drop their water? And the usual idea is to put out some kind of chemical into the clouds to cause the water to clump or be attracted to it so that a drop gets to be heavy enough that it falls out of the sky. Charlie's first paying job was in 1904, where he was hired to bring rain near Los Angeles. After four months of feeding the clouds, Charlie brought the city around 18 inches of rain, pleasing the city and officially launching his rainmaking career. He had done this all over the West, from Alaska to Texas and Idaho and Oregon. People had hired him to make rain in their area. So he was somewhat famous for this side business that he had. So San Diego approached him. Charlie Hatfield said he could fill the marina reservoir within a year. The marina reservoir to be filled held 15 billion gallons of water. It was only a third full, so Charlie had to be able to have enough rain and runoff to generate 10 billion gallons. And they all felt that for $10,000, that was a good deal. Charlie and one of his brothers immediately went out to Lake Marina. You can watch the video to learn the details of what he builds and chemicals that he's mixing 
but I just want you to hear this. The first rain that Charlie felt that he had enhanced began on about January 10th, and it rained fairly consistently both inland and in San Diego over the next three or four days. But on January 14th and 15th, it really began to pour. The heavy rains between the 14th and the 18th caused flooding in the San Diego River Valley. It caused flooding in the Otai River Valley. It caused some flooding in the Sweetwater River Valley. And it caused the lake behind the Otai Dam to become full. In fact, a little bit of water went over the dam on the Otai Dam at that point. Many roads were washed out. Many railroad lines were washed out with this first rain. But everybody felt that that was it because around the 19th, the rain stopped. But Charlie had a contract to complete. Marina Reservoir was to be filled. So upon his tower, he remained. Hatfield continued to use his chemicals and to continue the evaporation process even when these rains stopped for approximately a week. Apparently, Marina Reservoir wasn't full at that point. The rain started again on January 24th, but it wasn't severe and people weren't too concerned. But it continued, and it rained on the 25th, and it rained tremendous amounts on the 26th. And people throughout San Diego County began to get very concerned because they hadn't really had a major recovery from the first storm. Downtown San Diego records 2.19 inches of rain on January the 27th. But more importantly, San Diego River is 435 square miles. It goes all the way out to the backcountry mountains. And in some of those areas, rainfalls on January 27th were 24 inches, 30 inches. And so an incredible volume of water comes down Mission Valley. 72,000 cubic feet per second, the biggest flood of the 20th century in San Diego. People were trying to figure out how to just stay alive during this. The people in the city of San Diego were isolated because roads leading out were, were, had been wiped out. The rain wiped out most of the railroad tracks. Over 200 bridges throughout San Diego County were destroyed or, or gone. But the amount of rain still hitting San Diego made dam keepers worry. How much more could their dams take? The Lake Marina Dam, which was the focus for all of this rain, actually held up so Charlie was successful, he filled Marina Dam. The Sweetwater Dam was a different story. The Sweetwater Dam held, but it held because the rocks that were at the edges of the dam were eroded away by the amount of water that was there. So the water not only went over the top of the dam, but it went around the sides of the dam. But what we remember the most is the Otai Dam. Lower Otai Reservoir Dam collapsed as a result of this second storm. A 20-foot high wall of water moving eight miles an hour basically killed anybody who had not evacuated in the Otai River Valley. That remains the fifth deadliest dam failure disaster in U.S. history. The damage that were caused by these two storms and by the um, collapse of the Lower Otai Dam was devastating to San Diego County. Farms were destroyed. Animals were lost. You can imagine the San Diego River ran from Kearney Mesa to Kensington. People could not cross the river. The roads were washed out. The bridges were washed out. All of the railroad bridges were gone. Um, several railroads that had been built in San Diego before this time were never rebuilt. It was just too expensive and people were concerned that there might be another flood event. On January 30th, Charlie dismantled his tower and began heading back to receive his reward. Yeah, lots of, lots of awards, rewards for the rainmakers. This was in, what, 1902? Did you hear the date? Well, let's say 1902. 
don't you think militaries around the world now have perfected their rainmaking? Okay. What happened back in San Diego in 1902 is happening right now in Sydney, New South Wales, Southeast Queensland, Australia. This is aerial footage of the Sydney suburbs. Please, anybody who comes across this video and hears me right now, if you have not looked into weather modification, geoengineering, if you have not looked into militaries using weather as a weapon, please do it because they are destroying, they are destroying so many individuals. They're destroying farms, houses, livestock, life itself, and they call it climate change. They're calling it climate change. You have so many farms now in this area that are gone, destroyed. If you think <laughs> that once the flood waters recede from these farms that they can just recover and they're fine. That's not how it goes. There's so much damage and many, even if they can hold on to their properties, cannot use that land for several years after a flood like this because of the silt that builds up. There are so, thousands of homes are gone, thousands. You know, we've been living this now, years and years, just watching, just watching. They use this technology that they can use to create, manipulate, modify, intensify all kinds of weather fronts. They can create tornadoes. And yeah, militaries love to use it because it's like a spoofing, a spoofing technique. The plausible deniability is so great they can just claim it's natural. They can claim it's weather. It's a uh, global warming. Global warming. Wow, man. I've not heard from one particular Aussie sub, Sharon. I sure would like to hear from you, Sharon. Look at this. Such unbelievable devastation. Well, you know, the rainmaking in the United States going on for what? They've been at this for about 130 years. There are patents, weather modification patents that are back in the 1890s. So with all of the evidence that we have and we still can't seem to get through to people, I'm sorry, if, if you encounter someone who is you know, calling you a conspiracy theorist, they are complicit with the d destruction that is taking place. You're either on one side or the other now. It's black and white. You're either someone who is, well, it's exhausting and um, y you need to have, you know, a temerity that, that keeps you going. But if you're not trying to 
wake people up to this. You remain silent. You cannot not be complicit with this destruction. And it is unbelievable. You know, I look at these homes, I look at these farms, and when you think about how many people are elderly, don't have the resources to recover from this, that is, I'd say, the majority. Because in all of our countries, our economies have been deliberately destroyed. And so many people don't have jobs, have lost income. But even before the coronavirus, our economies were coming down. They were bringing them down. Yeah, there were some who were fine. And they believe the horseshit that they get from mainstream media about how the economies are just so robust and just so wonderful and unemployment is, you know, near zero. And it's all a lie. It was all a lie. So prior to this, people were struggling. And so when I come across, you know, this yet again, you know, I, I can't, the rainmakers carried out experiments over South Australia, Tasmania, the Snowy Mountains, the Waragamba Dam, which is right where there's lots of concerns, of, uh, concerns currently, presently, today about the dam. Oh, my God. Sydney, New England. They used dry ice, silver iodine to seed clouds, which resulted in the production of rain. Well, this is your um, Cicero. I don't know. It's uh, Commonwealth, sci Commonwealth um, Scientific and Industrial Research. I'm not sure if I got that right, but y you're, you have your own weather modification uh, agencies, companies that have been modifying the weather over Australia forever. In fact, you've allowed the U.S. military to do their experiments on creating meteors artificial meteors, simulating meteors, and a whole lot of meteors that we're seeing now, we don't know. In fact, if you know the characteristics of a meteor, you can see that some of these that they're calling meteors are not meteors. They're simulations produced by militaries. But that is a whole other story. Yeah, so, um, Australia, you guys in this area, I am so sorry. I am so sorry for what you are having to suffer because this is big. On the mid-north coast, a massive clean-up is underway as more rain hits. Thousands of homes are still without power and roads are cut off. Farmers are some of the hardest hit, with huge amounts of livestock lost. 15,000 people are homeless as the scope of the devastation becomes clear. We'll have more on that situation in the region coming up. The wild weather isn't letting up in Queensland either. Drivers are still taking risks. One ute was almost washed away while trying to cross a flooded roadway. The rain and rising waters are causing traffic chaos around the Gold Coast with highways cut off. Parts of the state's southeast have recorded almost half a year's rainfall in two days, while some are ignoring the warnings to stay clear of flood waters. 
Angie Asimus joins us with the very latest forecast. Angie, some parts of the state will see a reprieve this afternoon. That's right, Anne. The focus of the rainfall has shifted a little bit. You'll see at the start of the day the warning area in yellow here covered. Okay, you can um, just check out these channels. This is seven. Is it seven? Seven. News Australia. And you have nine News Australia. And they have an awful lot, an awful lot of videos on the on this incredible flooding but they have said that two weather fronts converged two weather fronts converged 18,000 under evacuation orders 16,000 calls for help 85 flood rescues school shut power down it's already 2 billion and growing the damages so, yeah. All right, well, guess what? The Australian companies manipulating our weather. Top news, Australia's front line. Over five decades, over five decades in Australia, the study of clouds, rain, and the atmosphere has been largely hidden from the public as a secretive network of government agencies and private business interests continue to manipulate the weather around us to their personal benefit. And yes, when you have now these multinational corporations, the very, very, very wealthy, they call them elite, oh, they are subhuman entities, but they are pulling us into a new world order for their benefit, and part of that New World Order is a tiny population. So they're getting rid of an awful lot of people. They're depopulating, and they want everyone in regions. They are reshaping these countries so that you have a small portion of the population that you have now in your respective countries in cities where they can have 24-7 surveillance and control over every aspect of your life. As crazy as that sounds, and it is pretty friggin' crazy, it's true. It's happening. So climate engineering, radiation management, reflective aerosols, those chemicals that Charlie Hatfield, the rainmaker, flooded out San Diego with uh, cloud seeding, CO2 air capture, mm, CO2 storage. Look at all of this, man. They have been at it. Haven't space mirrors? What? Well, all you have to do is do a little bit of research. I have, what, 314 videos on my weather modification playlist on my channel. You don't have to do the research because many of us have done that research for you. But in Australia, cloud seeding was first trialed in Australia in 1947 when this agency, um, is it Ciro? I'm not sure how you pronounce it, but they used the Royal Australian Air Force aircraft to drop dry ice into tops of cumulus clouds, according to the history, the, mether, the, the method worked reliably with clouds. This is in 1947. What do you think they have now to produce these floods that you see now? In 1947, this agency described this uh, weather modification uh, or this first documented case. This is believed to be the first documented case anywhere in the world of an appreciable, appreciable man-made rainfall reaching the ground and the first time that dynamic cloud growth had followed seeding. Well, now they have so many different methods. The electromagnetic frequencies, the lasers that they have. There's a tremendous amount of information. Mainstream media has reported on it. Hell, China, China now China announces expansion to weather modification program. 
artificial rain to cover an area bigger than the size of India. Wow. So China and Russia and the United States and, and so many different countries are modifying the weather. Man is controlling it, and man is bringing about an awful lot of destruction. Plain vapor trails over Adelaide. So, Ciro carried out similar trials from 1953 to 1956 in South Australia, Queensland, and other states, however, this time covering a large area instead of singular clouds as before, and developed new techniques to show to the world. Yay! A new way to make rain, the Sunday Morning Herald. 1950s and early 1960s, Ciro performed cloud seeding in the Snowy Mountains on the York Peninsula in South Australia, in the New England district of New South Wales, and in the Warragamba, not sure if I'm pronouncing that right, uh, this catchment area west of Sydney. Activities in Tasmania in the 1960s were successful. Tasmanian experiments were so successful that the commission has regularly undertaken seeding ever since in mountainous parts of the state. Work is done today by the Ciro Division of Cloud Physics under the Marine and Atmospheric Research, one of the largest operations in Australia, compared similarly to HARP in the United States, is the Jindali Operational Radar Network, JORN. Radar Network. Yes, that's why we have these Doppler radar uh, stations all over the place. Oh, it's not to track planes. It is to modify the weather. JORN became a core research project from 1970. Um, Lockheed Martin Corporation, uh, BAE Systems Australia, military, military, military. We are being attacked by military. It's a war. We're living a war. And if they were dropping bombs, everybody would unite. But it's weather. Plausible deniability. Oh, it's natural. Act of God. The most public cases of geoengineering to hit Australia was Project Storm Fury. Oh, I believe that was a U.S. military project, which from the mid-1960s to 1980s was a project dedicated to experimental hurricane modification. Storm Fury goes down under. Companies involved, geoengineering continues across Australia. In 2018, it's more advanced than ever. A good article with good research. Australian Rain Technologies. So, um... <laughs> so much rain on saturated ground can only build for so long, and this is the result. A disaster scene in the Gold Coast hinterland. It's a landslide or an earthquake or something. Right the first time, tons of concrete and twisted metal upended in a landslip at this steep Wongawalan property. Look closely, that's not a babbling stream, it's a driveway, or at least it used to be. There must be uh, over 100 foot of driveway undermined, collapsed, all sticking up in the air. And at the very top, a home perched precariously on soggy soil with a woman inside who, for a time, refused to leave despite the obvious danger. Police had no trouble convincing her neighbours living directly down the hill who promptly packed their things and took off. Just to think that that house could come down and hit our house, so definitely with the two little kids there. The area is totally off limits tonight. Anyone in the danger zones evacuated, including us. 
but we have to rush to get through because the causeway, the water there has come down, but it could go back up very quickly, trapping us again. So we are being told to get out right now. My cameraman and I joined police in getting out carefully across the causeway. When locals return, they can only wonder what they'll find. They'll find a lot of destruction, a whole lot. This is so unbelievably sad. A car roof, all that's visible as the water rises. Do you think there's any more in the water? Yesterday at Mount Tambourine, this minibus filled with passengers almost washed away. Whoa! And it took off down there and I just thought that was just putting all the passengers at risk and it wasn't necessary. A raging river running through restaurants, a torrent of water swallowing tables and chairs. We had it all secured, we thought this time, with all the fences, with wires through it, but waters are too, uh, too harsh and we took everything out. Today, this car in Springbrook, now a projectile. People scrambling for sandbags, the last line of defence for their homes. Carrara footy fields are being used for a different kind of sport. Now at least I can say I've kayaked on footy fields. The cleanup for some has already begun. Anthony's home at Talai went under yesterday. This morning they had their floorboards ripped up and their carpet thrown out. This afternoon they flooded again. It just kept rising and rising and then it just started coming in through the doors and uh, the window frames. We've had 12, 212 jobs come in. We've completed 77 to date. Beaches are closed. June's taking a battering at Burley. Students told to stay home as schools are swamped. The Gold Coast is really fortunate that we didn't have king tide this week. We're still watching wait, but so far we've dodged a bullet. And we're told the deluge is not over yet. Mackenzie Collahan, Nine News. Oh boy. <laughs> Even the most stoic are no match for nature's wrath, tears flowing for a livelihood swept away. Which is um, detrimental to our business because we're so young. Um, yeah, it's really tough. Tonight, their Deception Bay property lies in soggy ruins. A barn and shed trashed, feed and hay lost, saddles and bridles destroyed. Paddocks they've called home for four years, turning to pools in what felt like an instant. There's just so much water, I haven't seen it like this in ages. They raise horses here for birthday parties and riding classes. Sadly though, for Helen's own daughter, it's a cruel lesson learned. Her two chooks didn't make it. We're heartbroken at the moment. I guess you still have each other right and you're safe. Yeah. We do. We've got our family, we've got all our horses. So, very lucky there. For that, they had themselves to thank. At the height of the deluge, they saved all 12 horses. Oh, that was scary. Um, at one point I thought I was going to drown myself, trying to stay on my feet myself, and these horses don't know what they're doing with their own feet. The rain's not coming out of nowhere, but the flooding certainly is. We're told it took just 15 minutes for this water level to rise above that horse float's tyres. It is now a write-off. Considering how fast it came in on Sunday and how much destruction and damage it's caused already, um, potentially facing it again in one week is scary. Adam Hegarty, Nine News. Do not, do not expect these people to ever ever talk about weather modification, the technologies that militaries are using all over the world to create this destruction. And it's unfortunate that people are so addicted to mainstream media, they can't listen to anyone else. Dinghies deliver 20 dogs safely, almost lost to rising waters. The owner hasn't realised that it was coming up so quick and he got caught out, yeah. While this horse was lucky, hundreds of livestock have already been killed. No mercy for humans or animals, this woman and her cat, even a caged cockatoo, among those safe on higher ground. It's very good to, to see that they all made it and they're all alive. 
Though animals didn't take priority, this five-month-old rescued at Londonderry, along with another child, four adults and three dogs. Last summer, Western Sydney was the hottest place on earth at 50 degrees. Now, residents are enduring a 50-year flooding event in the middle of a pandemic. Don't you think it's odd that people have experienced drought, fires last year, and now this? I mean, it just doesn't stop, and people want to claim that it's climate change? It looks like the aftermath of an earthquake, a powerful chain reaction, rippling, popping, crumbling, 125 metres of bitumen from top to bottom on Boxer Street. It was like a big geyser, you know, just blew up. Very unsafe, very unsafe. Residents watched and rolled as a storm water drain blew open. And uh, this is just popped right then. As rapids of muddy water charged down. I'm going to go. A food delivery driver drove up, oblivious to the danger under her car. The rope is literally lifting underneath the car as she was driving. As we were talking to her through the uh, window, it was um, collapsing underneath her. She delivered the meal. It was her last. The bitumen gave way. Water lifted the road base like a blanket. It's now barreling beneath. Litres of rainwater gushing underground, gorging kilos of gravel. It's unstable. Yeah, they're, they're going to cause so much, so much. Enhancing the weather, governance of weather modification activities in Australia. They are going to cause so much damage. Welcome to Australian Rain Technologies, enabling confident commercial decision-making around rainfall enhancement. Isn't it interesting? Is it a snake? Is it a swan? No, it's an emu making a grand escape. The local pet gookie fleeing at speed through floodwaters at McGrath's Hill. Because she got scared, she just went all the way out. I didn't realise she'd have so much strength. But I thought it was a swan and it ended up being an emu. So I called you guys in the boat to rescue the emu. Hot on her heels, owner Paul Zammett, neighbours and Seven News cameraman Todd McDonald racing to rescue her in the pouring rain. But she wasn't giving up without a fight. Give me and Ken a real hard time putting her down. As your cameraman would know, he was there giving us a hand. Her grand adventure coming to an end returned safely back to shore. She's as good as gold. It's like a puppy to him, so, yeah. and he's just got an emu or two. With the amount of water, obviously, he was very stressed for how tired she was going to get. It was the potential of her drowning out there. Guki was at home on higher grounds before she was spooked and tried to flee. Her emu companion, Buki, made a similar attempt yesterday, but both are now safe and recovering in local backyards. So when I think about the lives lost, four-legged, two-legged, uh, the, 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 the flying, the, it's hard. But when they can create weather and do it easily now for the purpose of shuffling around people, then you can see how easily they can depopulate and move people into areas where they want them so that they can control every aspect of their life. Flood zones? Oh, they're thinking about you can't build in flood zones anymore. Well, the flood zones have been changing. And now, well, in the United States... There are so many areas that were not flood zones not too long ago. Now they're flood zones. Why? Because man is creating floods in those areas. The same thing is happening in Australia. The same thing is happening all over. 
homes underwater, whole communities under threat, sparking new debate about building on the floodplain. The Federal Emergency Management Minister says the state has to do more to keep residents safe. They have a responsibility in making sure that people build houses in appropriate places. Or pay the price. Not only in our insurance premiums, but as the federal government uh, representing the Australian taxpayer as the insurer's last resort. The Premier defending planning rules. You cannot build in uh, anything which is below the 1 in 100 flood level. So that's already in place. But we have to appreciate many of these communities have been around for a very long time. At Riverston, major flooding in Eastern Creek forced mm. a large number of families to head for higher ground. Which means... And they were doing experiments in the 70s. All right. Okay. Um, premiums, insurance. Insurance is going to be canceled. Your premiums are going to skyrocket. And this is happening in so many countries. Oh, boy. You know, if people would just take a look. Weather control claims put to the test. Yes, heated arguments and lawsuits. And there, there is... There have been lawsuits, companies who produced rain, 1950s in so many states, people suing those who flooded out their properties, their farms. Oh, but don't take a look at it. Just call people, you know, conspiracy theorists. Just claim that they're crazy. No, it's you who is crazy. Yeah. This week's conference also attracted, and what was the conference? Oh, uh, conferences all over the world on weather modification. Their technologies really date to the 60s and 70s. Um, China last year spoke with government officials about weather modification projects. Oh, my God. Here, one private firm proposes beaming microwaves into clouds to heat them up to form a plasma and dissipate tornadoes. But such plans have no scientific basis. Bullshit, I say, because you can see the microwaves. And I've shown them on radar and satellite, and it's magnificent. Department of Homeland Security in the United States had a meeting on hurricane modification. All right. Well, people will remain ignorant to our demise. Thank you very much for never looking into weather modification and just claiming that everybody is crazy. Well, by doing that, you allow the weather modifi modifiers to continue, and you allow these people to lie to you, and you accept the lies. What a fabulous life you are living. <laughs>